Good afternoon, happy Sunday to you and everybody that's watching this by way of Facebook. I'm Reverend Walter Mwambazi and I'm glad to be here this afternoon. And today, actually the topic I'm tackling is kind of related in many ways to what's going on. Um, I'm not going to mention in any way uh, through words what's going on. I'm not going to talk about what's going on, but those of you who have, are following my page today, you know it's a very, very touchy uh, topic. It's, it's caused a lot of dust and caused a lot of uh, pain, hurt, full words and division and that's going on. But that doesn't change the fact that it's going on. Let me also take this opportunity. I know very soon we might have one or two joining. It might be difficult for many to join because I am aware a lot of people are at church. So you will just catch this as a transmission. But I believe the topic is very, very interesting. So those of you who will be able to come live, please do so. Share with those who um, you would like to be part of this topic. Indicate to them, let them know, tag them and tell them that you are watching. Oh. Nice to see you here, my uh, prophetess, Abigail. Good to have you on board. And I'm looking forward to all the others that will be coming and viewing this. So without further ado, let me jump straight into my topic. And today I'm looking at a very famous um, individual in our country, uh, Mama Lenshina. Uh, some of you maybe may not be familiar with who this woman was. But I can tell you that this woman is a very, very powerful woman. She did ministry in this country many, many years ago, many years ago, before I was even born, before my parents even got married. That's how far back this woman operated. Those who are in Zambia know that this woman was one of the most prolific figures when it comes to the whole idea of the ministry she was operating and she operated under a very very interesting ministry and uh the sad part is that history painted her very bad she she had a great disservice in terms of history and so one of the purposes and reasons i'm doing this transmission today is kind of to you know add my voice to writing the wrong history of her. I've called it the good, the bad, and the ugly because I'm going to get into it. But what I also want to do in this transmission today is to help a lot of people get to understand what tends to happen in Christendom. And notice I use the word Christendom. I didn't say the kingdom of God. I say Christendom because Christendom is a religious movement. Uh, and like all religious movements, you have rules, you have rituals, you have procedures, you have gatekeepers who you call bishops and pastors and reverends and what have you. And they all basically manage this space. And so in managing this space, you have those that are the gatekeepers who get to pretty much determine what everybody else gets to be called. Ah, and I'm so happy we have somebody from Chinsalia, Kasonda Woodlede. Kasonda Lovede. Your name. Kakwala. You know, Simazunduli. That's a really tough name. There must be shorter names like Kasonda for you, you know. But glad to have you from Chinsali. You will understand the topic I'm talking about today has a lot to do with where you're from there in Chinsali because that was really the birth of uh, uh, Alice Lenshina's movement and church which came to be known as the Lumpa Church. So let's go into the history of Alice. And why am I speaking about this woman uh, of God? Why am I speaking about her? Because you will get to appreciate and understand the dynamics of what's going on even today in the church in Africa. Okay, so let's begin right away with the history of Alice Lenshina. Okay, so absolutely, huh? ah, nice, nice one, Albert. I've seen that. So, um, you know, and, and, and I tell you, Albert David, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to when I'll have the finances to do a real good documentary around her. I know a number of people have done them, but I just want to bring my perspective. But let's 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 do what we can today. Let me let me rush and see what I can do in these uh few minutes, what I can say to all of you and help you understand the the the, the story of this profoundly powerful woman. So let's begin with her history. So I'm getting into the good. So I'll do the good, the bad, the ugly. So let's let's begin with the good. 
What's the story about Alice Lanchina? I have gotten quite a bit of data, so I'm now giving those of you who are into research, just like Abbott talked about the National Archives, not good enough, you need more. So uh, there's two books that are out there, and unfortunately when I came on this transmission, I didn't carry my little book to, to write some things down, so apologies. But the first book that I think really does justice is the book by the governor of Chinsali. So the governor of Chinsali in 1964, some white guy, did write quite a bit uh, about this and uh, gave a very, very good report of what was going on. The BBC also, 1964 archives, have both the AP, that's Associated Press, uh, recordings as well as the actual write-up which was published in the newspapers of what happened in, 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 in June, July, August of 1964 during the Lumpa Church Uprising. So that's what they came to call them. Uh, and so, Musenga, you just have to increase your volume. Others are hearing me. So just increase your volume on your handset. So what happened with these um, uh, times is that uh, there were reports that were written by the BBC. There was reports that were done by the governor of Chinsali. He wrote a book. Even he's actually even on record in the local press uh, talking to Lenshina during the same skirmishes. And then later on, a man called Kampamba Mulenga, God rest his soul, wrote a detailed book called They Have Blood, uh, blood in Their Hands. That's what it was called, Blood in Their Hands. And in that book, he, 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 he now recounts the, the, the injustices done to not just the Lumpa people, Lumpa church people, but the prophetess herself, Alice Lenshina. So these are very good sources. You could also visit the archives at Zambia uh, Information Services, ZIS, or ZANIS as they call it nowadays. You will get quite a bit of data there. You can also go to ZNBC archives themselves. You will find some information there as well. So for those of you that are researchers, if you do a bit of collated research, you'll get the, the truth because it's usually somewhere in there. You know, so it's not so obvious because the history books of Zambia wrote and painted that woman really evil. You know, they, they say they were drinking urine and they were jumping off trees, believing they'll go to heaven. Like there was a lot of propaganda that was done around the Lenshina and Lumpa movement, which was absolutely untrue, 100% untrue. So just the work of, of propaganda. And uh, so because of that work of propaganda, it unfortunately led to a false history of this woman. And she's been the, the, the victim of a false history for a very, very long time. And it's only now that we're starting to get the truth. And that's what's really going on with history all across Africa. We're, we're starting to learn that there was a lot of false history about some of these people. And so why have I picked Mama Alice Lenshina? Because I, true, based on my own observation, do believe she was a genuine servant of God. So let's, let's go into our story. And when we do our story, you will realize how some of what we see today is happening. Okay? So... Mama Lenshina was born in, um, in the heart of Bemberland, I believe Chinsali itself, in one of the villages. I don't know which one it is. And from a young age, she had something special about her. But what we know for certain is that her story really comes to life when she's just a young girl. She should have been about maybe 14 or something. She was a teenager. And um, what happened is in that period, it is said amongst those who know her story, which can be found even among the archives of the uh, Scottish Missionary Church, which was very active, uh, Luvwa Mission in uh, Chinsali there. We, we, we have history. You can go and get the details. It is said that uh, at that time she became sick and it's believed that her, her illness was as a result of uh, malaria. So that's most likely that what she, that's what she suffered. So she had malaria became very sick, and it is said she died. Okay, so when she died, um, it is then purported that as she had died, she had a vision of Jesus. Jesus literally appeared to her. And, and what was her background in those days? Just Scottish missionary. There were no Catholics in that area. So she was Scottish missionary because that's what was there. Look what mission, like I say, and, and the work that was going on by the Scottish Missionary Church and missionaries in bringing the gospel to Africa in those days. We're talking about the 1920s here, probably 19, 
uh, yeah, 1920s, 1930s, somewhere there, probably in the 30s, in Lubwa, there in uh, Chinsali. And so she had this vision of Jesus, and Jesus came to her, told her the truth about who she is, told her that he, he, she will be used mightily by him, she will be an instrument of use by God to bring light to the people of that land. Those were the words that she purports were said to her by Jesus when he appeared to her. And what Jesus did then, according to the story, is point her to a particular priest, a father that was operating there. I've forgotten the name of the father, but he's a well-known man in the Lenshina story. When you go and get the books and write-ups, you will be able to get his name. It, it slips my mind right now. In fact, a lot of names slip, slip my mind, so bear with me. So when she, so she woke up, I mean, because she was dead, uh, and she woke up, and people were stunned, and it was a big deal, and as soon as she was able to speak, she indicated that she needed to go and see Father Whatever his name was, and so when she went to Father Whatever, then she recounted her events, what happened to her in the vision, and that God had told her that Father Whatever his name was, was going to teach her, I think it was Father Robert or something, but he was going to teach her the truth about salvation. And that's how this father, this priest now, led uh, Mama Lenshina, that time a young maiden, to the Lord. Uh, led her to the Lord and began the work of discipling her. Now, as this was going on, something strange happened. People that had issues, when I don't know what was the first event, but it is said that there is something that happened and she was led to pray for someone who was sick and they got healed. And then word went round and, and people started coming for healing. Now, she was a very young girl, but even though she was a young girl, she had a very strong drive. And one of the, the drives that she was given, and this is very important, I have to mention this, is she was informed to inform all the people to let go of witchcraft and African traditional beliefs. That is something that Mama Lenshina categorically was informed by Jesus. And so the Lumpa church in those days, and anybody who knows history will testify, was big on getting witches, wizards, practitioners of African traditional medicine to all bring their things and have them destroyed and surrender their lives to Jesus. So she was very evangelical. That, that just needs to be known. She was very evangelical. And so in that evangelical state, she brought revival. Because, you see, she was moving not just by words, but God was now using us. She was now operating by power. Now, I don't have permission, so I can't mention. But one of the well-known fathers and bishops in this country can testify. And by the way, you know, when it comes to Lenshina, a lot of people don't know this. The Lumba Church that later on formed because of what she did became so popular that even relatives of the former President Kaunda were at that church. So people like Mama Helen Kaunda, uh, people like uh, Reverend, uh, not the Reverend, not the Reverend uh, David Kaunda, no. But, although, remember the Reverend David Kaunda, the father to our president, former president, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, was also a missionary and in that same mission, Luwa Mission and uh, under the Scottish missionary. So, you understand that, uh, yes, Andrew, she did come to the saving knowledge because she was led by Father, whatever his name was, to the Lord. And she had a vision of Jesus, so she was very powerful. And not only that, like I was saying, not the Reverend Doctor, uh, sorry, the Reverend uh, David Kaunda, but the brother Robert Kaunda was part of the Lenshina Lumpa Church. He, I need to confirm with people like Doctor Nevers Mumba, but I believe a number of relatives within the that family were also impacted by uh, this particular woman. So, in other words, you know that Doctor Mumba is related to. To, to Simon Mueralane, the, the mother, I think their brother and sister, and uh, Cosmo Mumba as well, that whole Mumba family, they were all part of that setup. And not, not part of the Lumpa church, but they were in Chinsali, they knew each other, and they knew the impact that Lumpa church had. So Lumpa was very, very influential, and I'll get around to it. 
So essentially, God began to use this woman very powerfully. And because of what God was doing in her life, because of leading people into deliverance, having people, you know, delivered from demonic oppression because she would preach the gospel and get them to surrender all their traditional things. So Lumpa Church grew very, very quickly. Like it overtook the Scottish Missionary Church of the time. So even the Lumpa Mission began to lose people to the Lumpa Church. And now here's the way, now the, the, at the time the Lumpa Church hadn't been born. So what happened? When this woman was being used by God, when she was still a young girl, she was still a young lass, one of the challenges she faced is that in those days, the Scottish Missionary Church, and not just the Scottish Missionary Church, but most of the Christian movements did not uh, approve uh, the, the, the ordination of women. The ordination of women, the uh, women preaching the gospel, or even doing any kind of work relating to the gospel was forbidden. They really took uh, that passage in Corinthians very seriously. In fact, a bunch of our, our denominations, even today, including the church where I fellowship, have that same view that women should not preach, women should not be in front of men, talking to them and all that jazz. I don't subscribe to that and I openly say so. But here's the point. This particular situation meant that this young lass called Alice could not do any kind of work relating to ministry in that place. They all acknowledged and saw how God was using her powerfully, but they could not, they could not connect, they could not allow her to do what she was doing because, like I say, it was believed that they should not be, you know, women cannot preach, women cannot do any of these things. They can only be quiet at home with their own husbands and preach in their homes. And so unfortunately, uh, you see, and, and I'll say this, when God is using someone, God is using someone. We, we can bring all the rules of our church and, and our tradition and we can say whatever we want to say, but that, that will not change what goes on when when god decides to use this individual he will use them and, and that's what happened with this mama god began to use her powerfully and so because of this skirmish she had to be excommunicated from the church so that's how the lumpa church formed because you see when they excommunicated her and i believe that she was still in a teenage when they excommunicated her or if not a teenage then her early 20s somewhere there but when they excommunicated her, a lot of people followed her and begged her to continue the work because of how God was using her. So you see, that's how they ended up now bringing an eldership around her. She got married and then she had, you know, she became a typical woman of those days. Now, one of the things that you must also note very, very seriously is that Mama Lenshina had no formal theological training whatsoever. Besides the basic discipleship given to her in those days by this father, there was nothing else. So the knowledge that this woman moved with was purely based on the kind of anointing that God had placed on her head. So she, and, and you know, the anointing was indisputable. What, what God was doing through this woman was indisputable because, you know, it's the same situation we have even today. One of the reasons why it becomes very difficult for followers of specific, uh, you know, prophets in our land today, and I mean in Africa today. One of the reasons why it's so difficult for people to accept or deny is because they see the power. You get my point? They see God move. They see miracles take place. And when you have these kind of events taking place, argue with the miracles. That's the argument people say. Argue with the power. And that becomes very difficult. So, with Mama, she had a similar scenario because even though she was not formally trained as a, as, a, as, a, as a theologian with all the theological background, God was using her mightily. And there was massive deliverance, not just in Chinsali. Her ministry moved all the way up into the eastern part of Zambia, Chama North, Chama South, into Chipata. Her influence went into the Copper Belt. Her influence went all the way to the western parts of Zambia. She really became popular. And a lot of people began to go to Chinsali. You see, Chinsali became 
You know this story. You know where I'm going with this. This is exactly what we've seen happen even today. So many people started to make their way into Chinsali because her reputation preceded her. And remember, this is a time where there were no TVs, no radio ministry. She literally just preached in an open space and word went out there. There's this woman, there's this woman, there's this woman, there's this woman. And people would travel from far and wide to go and have impact and know more about this woman of God. And when they got there, obviously things happened and more people came and more people came. Now, and here's what really becomes interesting. Remember she was, she was um, excommunicated by the mainstream church. Uh, so that in itself began to cause skirmishes. So that became one of the factors that will feature later. But what's, what's actually also very serious is that in the process, God was right, was, he wrought powerful miracles in her hands. There is one bishop, I can't mention the name, uh, who when he was the age of either eight or 12, I can't remember the details, but he testified with his own mouth on his platform. He did testify about this. When he was that age, they, him and his brother ate some poisoned roots. I don't know how in the process of going to, 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 to collect root, uh, you know, cassava and stuff for food, they got wrong stuff and then it was cooked and it was poisoned and they died. Okay, they died from the poisoning of these roots. And so as their, their dead bodies were laid in the, in the hut and the mother rushed off to go to look for this prophetess, Mama Lenshina. And they got there, they found the woman, and they came back with her, and, uh, oh, wow, there you go. So Gift, sorry, I'll come back to sorry. Gift Gwen uh, here is saying that uh, she knew the late lecturer, Mr. Kampamba. He's the one who wrote, yes, he wrote a book about her, my sister. The name of the book is Blood in Their Hands. I did reference it at the beginning. Glad to have you on the call, Gift. So anyway, back to my story. So they rushed and got this woman, and she came. And when she reached there, she went into the hut and prayed. And the woman came, sorry, the two youngsters were resurrected. They came back to life. That is something that the village witnessed. Now, there's stories like that that surround this woman. So she became an enigma. Take it from me. She became an enigma. And uh, by the time we get into 1964, when uh, Zambia is now on the verge of independence, the church, the Lumpa church was a force to reckon with. This church had more numbers, hear me? It had more numbers than any other church. So we're talking Catholics, we're talking the Scottish missionaries, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, you know, you had the Adventists in, I um, forgot the mission in Southern province at Chikankata, I believe, uh, you, you had, uh, Western province, I can't remember who was there, but you had all these missions that had been birthed by missionaries in those days, and churches were born of those. So, you know, that means you've got your Lutherans, you've got your, your uh, what are they called, a Presbyterian in Eastern province, because they basically landed in Lundazi and in, um, in Mzizi, Mzuzu, sorry, in, 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 in um, Malawi. You had Chinsali with Lubwa Mission, the Scottish missionaries. You had other missionary centers all across the country, and the churches were born out of that. Now, here's the interesting part many don't know. The, Lubwa, the, the Lumpa church was so profoundly impactful that so many left and went to that church. At the time, 1964, the Lumpa church had 150,000 members in Zambia. 150,000 members in a country of 3 million people. Look at the impact. That's why the Lumpa Church was a force to reckon with. You know, they, they had more influence than anyone else. It's amazing today that this woman who later becomes branded as a witch and a sorceress wrote the, the Bemba hymnals most of the UCZ Church used today. Songs like you know, those tunes and a lot of tunes, a lot. I can tell you in the Bemba hymnal today, over 50% of those songs are Lumpa Church origin, written by the Lumpa Church. Okay, so, 
So it's about, it's, it's amazing, huh? How, how a, a woman that then is brandished by history as evil and a sorceress is sourced as material for the hymns we sing today. So these hymns are sing, sang in the Catholic local churches, in the UCZ, in, in, the, in the Presbyterian, okay, not the Presbyterian, because most of them were Bemba songs. So if you find any Bemba songs today that are hymns, these were done as works by the Lumpa Church for their, for their members. So that's the story of the Lumpa Church in 1964. So I'm done with the good. Now let me come to the bad. So, and by the way, before I come to the bad, I have just been uh, made to remember. The work, the hand and power that I saw based on my historical reading of Mama Lenshina in my understanding is very similar to the hand and power that was put on the life of a, another great servant of God in Africa called Simon Kimbango. So most of you may not be familiar with Kimbangu unless you're from Congo. Congo has what they call the Kimbanguist church or the Kimbanguist movement. Who was Simon Kimbangu? Another very, very powerful. In fact, if I read the story of Alice Lenshina and I read the story of Kimbangu, they're very similar. These are people that God literally revealed himself to because when you study the life of Kimbangu, you see a similar pattern. He also had a visitation from God and God began to use him with powerful miracles. Pow pow powerful miracles. And so because of those miracles, then he became a threat. Just like Kunka is raising here. People of this magnitude become a threat to the establishment. And unfortunately, Alice Lenshina, just like Kimbangu, became a threat to the establishment. Kimbangu was actually sentenced to death, you know, in Congo. And really, if you study the stories, because I've read the history books, there's nothing that man did. He didn't do anything where you say there was a scandal. No, he just was a man who operated with so much power that it threatened the existing churches of the day in the Cath in, in in the in the in the in Congo is the Catholic Church very powerful in in Zambia it was the Scottish Missionary Church which later became UCZ so they they found a threatening but but to be honest to the favor to the to the credit of the Scottish Missionary Church that wasn't really where the problem came from for, for Alice Lenshina and the, and the Lumpa Church, unlike in the Congo, where it really did originate from the Catholic Church, even though there were members within the Catholic Church who felt differently. In other words, they did not agree with the general position. But the reason why Kimbangu was a threat is because of his influence. He was seen as a very real threat. He had churches across the entire Congo. And Congo has, I think, 26 provinces. It's a big place. And to have influence of that nature as a black man in the 1940s. <laughs> no, 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 no. Your, 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 your colonialists would not want a band like that. And these are, these are people that they wanted to bring on board. But Kimbangu was very deep into his work. And, and, and that was the case. So they, they charged him and they found him guilty and they sentenced him to death. And the story is, this is... Um, this is in the, in the history books. So I don't know whether it's true or not true, but it's in the history books. The story is that they took Kimbangu, put him in a drum, sealed it tied with the chains and threw it in the sea. Uh, so he drowns in the sea. And uh, the story is that after they did that, the next morning when they came, they found him sitting on the side of the sea, completely unscathed, unharmed, with no chains. Now that scared them. So what they did simply then is to throw him in prison and he spent the, the remainder of his life in prison until he died in prison. I believe he must have died in the 50s. But by that time, the man had become a legend. And this is where I want to also come in with, with uh, what's her name, with Mama Lenshina, because you're gonna see how these things go and how they relate. So let's come back to Zambia. But for me, these two servants of God, I call them servants of God because I've read their history. I've studied their background. I studied the war that was waged against them, against them in terms of the, the establishment of the day in, 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 in Congo, the, the Catholic Church and, and, the, and the government uh, 
the colonial government, not, not the Congolese government, but the colonial government. And then in Zambia, uh, the colonial government, but really the political parties of the day, specifically UNIP. So let's go into the bad. All right, so what happened in the bad? So in the bad, um, <clears throat> when, you know, looking at the influence that Mama had, Mama Lenshina had, there was a lot of concern when, uh, when they were able to get to a place of agreement between uh, ZANU, uh, ZANU, I don't know what they were called those days, ZANK and I don't know what the other party was called, but basically the movement under Kapwepwe and Kaunda and the movement under um, uh, Harry Mwangankumbula. So there was a lot of skirmishes going on, fights over, over who can rule who. You know, this thing of Bembas and Tongas is not new. So that thing was all over the place. And that's why you notice Kaunda was so big on tribal balancing because he had to run with that to make sure he kills completely any form of tribalism. I'm not going into the Kaunda story. So what happened is at that phase, for reasons best known to Mama Lenshina herself, she chose not to align with UNIP. Okay? That's where the problem started. She asked her followers, who were in the hundreds of thousands, not to follow UNIP. Now that proved problematic. You must remember that uh, in, in, uh, in, in Chinsali, her influence was massive, massive. And so because of that influence and that position, what then ended up happening is the, the youth, the UNIP Youth League in Chinsali, led by Kapasamakasa, Robert Kapasamakasa, I believe, um, began to have skirmishes with the Lumpa Church people. They actually started to have skirmishes. They started to fight back and forth with one another, and, and, and it became quite a problem. And, and these fights escalated. So as they escalated, obviously there were times when uh, there was approach to talk to Mama Lenshina and ask her if she could be willing to ask her followers to vote for UNIP because they were the ones who were going to unseat the National Party or whatever they were called in those days. That's the white uh, ruling party of that time, under Walensky, if you recall. And uh, here in Zambia, after Walensky's um, uh, federation failed, he quit and then we had Sir Evelyn Horn. And so Evelyn Horn was the governor of this part. And so he was working with the Prime Minister of Zambia at the time, uh, Dr. Kenneth David Kaunda, as Zambia's first Prime Minister. And so we, they needed all these blacks to come together, but Lumpa would not. And so began your problems. And unfortunately, as these skirmishes got wilder and wilder, uh, the governor of Chinsali, that same man, whatever his name is, the British guy, uh, asked for reinforcement by, from the Zambia Rhodesian, uh, sorry, there was no Zambia at the time, Rhodesian police to go and try and control the mess that was going on over there. And so the Rhodesian police went there, uh, and it was quite a, a, a re reinforcement. They failed to control the situation, and so they asked for National Guard. So, so now, I don't know what they were called in those days, but the Zambia army anyway. So they then went, so we had the Zambia army, we had the Zambia, uh, uh, sorry, the, sorry, the, sorry, Northern Rhodesian army, Northern Rhodesia police, uh, who, NRP, who went there to try and bring, you know, control to the whole situation. And that, my friends, is where tragedy stuck, struck for Zambia. We, if we have a history that we need to repent as a nation, if we have blood that we need to repent for nationally, it's these events surrounding what happened at Lumpa Church. Because on those days now, we had the police come in, the soldiers come in, the Lumpa people ran and scampered in all kinds of directions, and it was, for lack of a better word, a massacre. Don't take my word for it. The Afri Associated Press has videos you can see dead bodies littered in villages uh, of, of, of Zambians being killed, Lumpa church members being shot dead, being bayoneted, being, uh, having, having their, 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 there was, you know now the problem is that there was also the 
joining in of the youth. I don't know how the details are, but what I know is the youth joined into this. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, people who were pregnant had their stomachs disemboweled. It's there. It's there. And, and, and this, the governor, he, he writes about it in his book. And the BBC report mentions it. So in three days, 700 Zambians lost their lives. Now the challenge is, as these Lumpa people were running away, because they ran in different directions. There are those who ran north into Tanzania. There are those who ran west into the Congo. And then there are those who ran east into Malawi, uh, going through Chama South, Chama, Chama North, Chama South, Lundazi, and then into, into Malawi, but not many. They, they, they ran into a lot of reinforcements and there were multiple wars. There were multiple skirmishes and wars and many people got killed on both sides. Okay? So, so with this death of so many people, there you go. AC Mulenga is saying the mass graves are there in Chinsali. Very correct. 700 Zambians in Chinsali alone were butchered by the Northern Rhodesian police and the guard the Northern Rhodesian Guard, or whatever they were called, the army, the predecessor to the Zambia army. They, they massacred people. Like I'm saying, the archival footage is there. You can find it. It's with Zanis. It's with Associated Press. If you hunt enough on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube, you will see the footage of those dead bodies. There are places where you see tons of dead bodies and a lot of Lumpa church members being arrested, being kicked, being beaten, uh, and being loaded on Land Rovers back in those days and taken to various detention centers. So it was a real disaster, a real disaster. And because so many people died in such a short time, they had to create a cover-up. So this is where the cover-up that you and I know and learn in school comes from. Number one, they called Alice Lenshina a witch, a wizard and a cult leader. They say that she told her, her, lead, her people to, to be drinking urine and, and, and to eat their feces. These are the stories that were circulated. And uh, they also said that she told her, her, lead, her, her people that they will go to heaven and so that they, they climb the trees and jump off the trees and they will be taken to heaven by angels. These are not true stories. And that's, of course, the excuse they use to justify the dead bodies. That all these dead bodies you see here, these are the people that were jumping off the trees but fell to their death. Now, you, you've been to Chinsali, right? <laughs> you know, just go to Chinsali right now and look at the Chinsali, um, what do you call it? The, 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 the vegetation in Chinsali. Are there tall trees that people can jump from and die? Like 700 of them? Yeah, so you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sad history of our, our land. And as far as I'm concerned, when Kampamba Mulenga, the late lecturer, wrote that book, he called it blood in their hands because of those deaths. That the blood of those 700 Zambians, well, that time there were no Zambia, 700, you know, believers and followers of the Lumpa Church is in the hands of the government because they're the ones who caused the death. Now, as all this was going on, how did it stop? It stopped because Mama got wind of all these terrible things going on because what they did is obviously they took her away from the place because they were trying to protect her but as she heard the deaths and and the terrible things going on she willingly surrendered and that's the part you see you the the the, the followers of of mama wanted to have her uh, protected at all cost to the death but she said no we are children of God. We are Christians. We cannot allow people to die for me. No, no, no. She refused adamantly and went and surrendered herself. That's history. It's there. There are videos and pictures of Mama Lenshina surrendering in Chinsali town. If it's not Chinsali, Kasama, I can't, no, it must have been Chinsali. She went and surrendered willingly to the authorities. And so when she surrendered, that's how the, all the skirmishes came to a standstill. By which time, remember, many had already run off in different directions. This is 1964. Radios were rare. There was no television. You only read what you saw in the newspaper. And the newspaper took a day to two days to reach such places. So the news would come from Chinsali, go to to Ndola, where you had the printing presses. They would print the stories, and then they would go back to Chinsali. So you're talking about events 
that would happen today would only become news after three days or four days. So it's very important that a lot of people understand the dynamics of what was going on those days. So it was very easy, and that's exactly what they did. They just went to the national broadcaster, and they said, there is this terrible witch called Alice Lenshina. She is a wizard. She's a sorcerer. She's caused the death of 700 of our people. Yada, yada, blah, 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 blah. And that's what became the news. So, so you've got to understand that was the bad. And um, you'll be amazed to know that though many of her, run, her people ran away and they were captured and tortured by government, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, they never tortured Mama Lenshina. They never touched that woman. All they did was keep her under lock and key in different prisons and they would move her from prison to prison and she stayed that way from 1964 right through independence to 1975 for 11 years that woman was moved back and forth from prison to prison there are videos my friends you can get them of associated press because she really did raise quite a dust storm and there was so much negative stories about her so there are many independent news people who came to to, to try and understand the story of Lenshina. A lot of them felt there could be something funny here. So they did come with their cameras and they did film her in prison. There are actually video clips of her being, uh, of to her talking to Kaunda. Kaunda would go to visit her. You see, this is what many of you don't understand. They, he'd go to visit her. And not just Kaunda, a number of government people, especially from the northern part of Zambia, Kapwepwe, I know for a fact, and a number of leaders went to visit her, including people like Kapasa Makasa. They went to visit her. Okay, so why did they visit her? Because they knew that this woman was a woman of God. They knew that those stories were not true about her. But you see, Zambia was at a place in history where they needed the unity. And so politically, it was expedient that she become the sacrificial lamb. Okay? So she became the, the sacrificial lamb for the purposes of protecting the overall integrity of the nation of Zambia. Zambia was just getting born then. There were lots of issues being dealt with, tribalism being right up there. And they needed a unifying factor. Kaunda, UNIP, one party, these were big deals. So even though we were not a multi-party democracy because, um, um, well, they neutralized the opposition, if you like, which was Zank. Although they were not opposition, they were just, you know, a different part of Zambia. They, they, they merged them. And exactly, thank you, AC Molenga. It's one of the reasons KK could never go back to live in Chinsali. He has Shambhala Kale Farm, powerful building. It's right there. But that man could never go back and live in Chinsali because the Chinsaliites are very fresh in knowing what the UNIP government in those days through the agency of the colonial government did to the people of Chinsali, did to the followers of Lumpa Church. And, and you see, that's another reason, a lot of people don't know this, that's another reason why when Chiluba came into power, what was one of the first things he did in 1991? Chiluba knew the story of the Lumpa Church. He created an amnesty and said, let all the Lumpa Church people come back to Zambia. Lumpa Church was banned as a church in this country for many years. Okay, so they were banned. Nobody allowed Lumpa Church to operate in this country. No license, nothing. And so the owners, the, the, the holders of the Lumpa Church had to spend decades as, as fugitives in Zambia. They had to run around and meet secretly and they knew each other, but they kept it very secret because if any time it was heard that Lumpa Church is meeting, the propaganda done in the 60s was enough. They would come for you like a ton of bricks and you'd go to, to Red Brick Building for torture. And what was the excuse? They believed that you're preaching heresies and you're a witch and you're a wizard and you're a cult leader. Ka uh, Dr. Kaunda is on record on... Um, on a documentary series done by the BBC in the 1980s called The Horse and the Rider. Anybody who, who's serious, you can actually type on YouTube, Horse and the Rider, you will see the clips, and they're there. And Dr. Kaunda is on record repeating the lie 
that this is a this was a church of people where they drank urine and ate feces and believed they could jump in the trees and go to heaven. He's on record saying that. And he said that had to be controlled. But it's a different story. It's a different thank you, noble. That's true. It is the reason why that declaration was not taken seriously. Because there were many people within the country who knew what they did to the Lumpa Church. But the thing is, the media is powerful. Uh, I think somebody quoted earlier, until the day the lion learns to write, that's Chinu Achebe's quote, until the day the lion learns to write, the tail will always justify the hunter. It will always praise, it will always praise the hunter, not the lion. So, unfortunately, Mama Lenshina was a victim of politics and regionalism. Okay? So, <clears throat> sorry about that. I just have to give you that background. That's what formed the bad. So, Mama spent her entire 11 years uh, moving from prison to prison. She, there's no major prison in Zambia she did not make resident. But because of the power that was on her life, and because of the grace that was in her life, and because of how God used her, even in prison, she had her own place, her own room. She was highly revered. Take it from me. There were people that could go and visit her in prison. So you will find those information. So now, let's come to the ugly. Oh, let me finish the story of Lenshina. So in 1976, she was finally released 12 years after being all over, but she was released only to be under house arrest. By that time, house arrest was quite common. We know that even the other freedom fighter for Zambia, Simon Mwansakapwepo, was also under house arrest at the time because Zambia had become a one-party participatory democracy in 1973. And so... Uh, anybody that was deemed a threat to the country was put in such places. And uh, again, you know, I'm not going to demonize Kaunda. And I'll tell you why I want to demonize him. I will not demonize him because Kaunda at that time was dealing with powerful forces within the region. We were, we were talking about South Africa present. We were talking about Rhodesia present. These were powerful white supremacy governments that were running and destabilizing these countries that were not yet free. And at that time, we had Angola, it was not free. We had Mozambique, it was not free. We had Namibia, it was not free. We had Zimbabwe, it was not free. And so the resolution of those early Pan-African leaders was that we're not going to rest as Africans until every country is free. So we're gonna support all our comrades by helping them with their liberation movements. So essentially, Zambia was viewed as a great enemy of the white supremacy governments of South Africa and Rhodesia those days, and, and Namibia, by the way, because Namibia was part of, of South Africa. It was called Southwest Africa. So these three countries with white supremacy uh, rules were the ones that were running things. So they were looking for ways and means in which they could support insurgencies within these countries, especially Zambia. And so remember, the Congo under Zaire, oh sorry, Zaire under Mobutu was the center for the CIA. Okay? So because they were the center for the CIA, that meant they were 100% under the control of the Americans, the Belgians and the British. And so they, need, they, they, they collaborated, it's not even a secret, they collaborated with the South African government, the South West African government, and the Rhodesian government to ensure that they push white supremacy uh, policies and rules. So Kaunda sat in a very precarious place. And so any form of instability in the nation was very dangerous. So he had to use methods like that where you suppress people like Kapwepwe and whoever. And unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, Mama Lenshina found herself in those dynamics. She found herself in those dynamics because these became, became so critical that Kaunda had to have a top level level of security. Don't forget that that's the time that uh, in, 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 in Uganda you had Amin who had taken over and he was committing horrible atrocities, even though no one heard about it at the time, it was still top secret, but already word was out there. And so you had those challenges. Malawi, a lot of people don't remember this, but Malawi 
was viewed as a sellout. Kamuzu Banda was always considered a sellout in the, uh, in the, in the Pan-African movement because he was pro-America. And I think a number of you remember that uh, <laughs> there's a, a very funny story around Kamuzu Banda. History teaches us that when Kamuzu Banda left to go and study in America, he went to Harvard or wherever it is he went to, and he stayed so long away from Zimbabwe, as from Malawi, that when he came back, he had forgotten his home language. He had forgotten Chichewa. Something which is really weird, because, I mean, unless Kamuzu Banda left in his childhood, like as in he left when he was 12 or 10 or 8, how do you forget your mother tongue? But they claim he did. So there's a, a rumor within the, the, the clandestine circles that that Kamuzu Banda was not the original Kamuzu Banda, that they swapped the Kamuzu Banda. The real Kamuzu Banda was killed. This is just a rumor, I'm not saying it's true, but they say that he was killed and the double was put in his place. So a typical African-American who was trained, given the history and background of who Kamuzu was, and he then became the imposter that went back with the support of the CIA to be in Malawi. And that's why Malawi remained a supporter of the West. So in Africa, we had, uh, uh, what's his name? It's the Zairean president, Mobutu Bat Mobutu. And then we had Kamuzu Banda and we had uh, Daniel Arab Moy. No, Kenyatta. Kenyatta or Moy, one of the two, I can't remember. But I know that even Kenyatta did not really take on an anti-American view. And that's one of the reasons why that uh, it reached a point where even Kenya and Tanzania and the East African community broke down because the East Africans, specifically Uganda and Tanzania, considered Kenya a sellout because they were supporting the CIA. They had their station for the CIA there. They had all their operations for the CIA there. So, so in Africa, the CIA had very good uh, allies in terms of nations to operate from in Kenya, uh, Zaire, and Rhodesia. Okay, so Rhodesia. Uh, Malawi, for some strange reason, they never ever improved it or built its infrastructure. I've never understood the logic behind that. So back to Mama Lenshina. So Mama Lenshina then spends the remainder of her life from 1976 to her death, which I think was either 1978 or 79, I can't recall, in her home. She was uh, under house arrest. She lived as a prisoner in her home the remainder of her life. She was never allowed to go back and preach to her people. She was never allowed to address any of her people. If anybody that went to visit Mama Lenshina from the Lump, well, first of all, there was no Lumpa church, remember? But whoever went to visit her, relatives, whoever, they had to do it under the watch of the police. So police would escort, would be present in that meeting as they spoke. Can you imagine you go to visit your mom and there's a, 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 a state, an agent of the state standing there listening? Every word that was discussed there. She had no phone and she couldn't be with more than one person at a time. That's how Mama Lenshina spent the remainder of her life until she died. So it's, it's, it's a really sad story, I must admit. Um, uh, because, I mean, imagine, put yourself in her shoes. You're a servant of God, anointed by Jesus Christ himself, able to, 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 to bring about so many miraculous things. Your life is a flow of miracle and power with a mandate to see salvation for people and you end up spending the remainder of your life as a prisoner. Unfortunately, that's what happened to her. So, very quickly, let me get to the ugly. So what's the ugly with uh, Mama Lenshina and the Lumpa Church? As is typical of people of her caliber, one of the dangers that comes in time is that these people, when they come, when God raises them, they're so powerful. They're an enigma. They move with such an unusual anointing. And that's what Alice Lenshina had. I equate Alice Lenshina to Kimbangu like I did earlier on. But if we went to the West and what God was doing in the West, I would put at the same level with John G. Lake, William Branham, Charles Finney. Yes, I would put her at that level. Because you see, that's how God was using this woman. God wrought very powerful miracles at the hand of 
Mama Alice Lenshina. That's why she was revered. That's why she was respected. That's why she was treated with great respect. Believe me, even when they arrested her, it wasn't the arrest of, of Lumumba. No, that's not how Mama Lenshina was arrested. They actually said, Mama, let's go. You know, that, that kind of thing. But nobody roughed her, nobody did anything to her because they really feared this woman. That this is a woman with power. Why? Because they saw what she did. They saw the power she commanded in people. But being a true woman of God, she said, no, we are believers. We don't fight. Ours is not a kingdom of the earth. Do not fight. Those who fought from our followers were just being followers. Like you have people shooting at me here uh, who, who are supporters of papas. It's normal. You expect it. So, where's the ugly? From, first of all, Mama Lenshina had no theological training, like I've said many times. Okay? So, because she didn't have theological knowledge, and it's not because she didn't want to learn, but she lived in a time where pretty much the entire church said women can't preach. So she came from that background where they said, women can't preach, women are not allowed to preach, this is not of God, don't, don't, don't teach a woman how to preach, let her be in the house. You know, there's a number of denominations I've said before who, who, who have that view. And so that was very strong. So even though she had this apparent power, which everybody saw, they never taught her anything concerning the Bible. So Mama Lenshina preached the Bible from memory. Imagine that from the Bemba translation, she preached the Bible from memory. She knew the word of God from memory. And how did she know the word of God? Because she sat and heard the word of God as she was being discipled under father, whatever his name was, in her teenage into her early 20s. So she could recite large parts of scripture straight out of her head. Because remember, she was illiterate. She never learned how to read and write. She never had the opportunity to be educated to read and write. And why is that? Because God started to use her so powerfully when she was such a young girl. So from early on, nobody, she couldn't even go to a school. How? Because all this group of people would be following this woman, coming to a house, sitting to be helped, to be prayed for. She'd have queues in Chinsali, in the villages. They would be following this woman just to go and sit and listen to her and, and, and be taught by her. So now you tell me, what time is she going? And she was a young girl, like I told you. She was just a young damsel in her late uh, teenage, getting into her 20s. So what time would she have to learn in school? And remember, she got married early like all the women uh, in those days. They would get married very early, 18, 19, they're already married. So she got married very early. Yeah, you can find that out from her children because she has a lot of children and grandchildren around even today. I'm sure a number of you will tag me to her family and many will be able to testify in the comments. They will come in and say, yes, it's true. So because of this lack of education, and then secondly, from 1964, her church grew to 150,000 people. She had the largest congregation in Zambia. Now, what happened to her? They locked her up at that stage. And from that time, basically from July, June, whenever that was, 1964, to her death, she never directly addressed her followers. And, and I want you to understand the dynamics of what I'm about to tell you. She never directly could address her followers. And very quickly, her church was banned. So by the time Zambia is independent, Lumpa Church is already banned. No Lumpa Church in Zambia. So it had no leaders to write home about. They could not operate in this country. They split. Others went to Tanzania. Others went to Congo. Others remained underground here in Zambia. Of course, over the years, many spread to different parts of Africa. But there were essentially no Lumpa church in Zambia. So what happened is, as these people continued to wait and lurk, wondering if their leader is ever coming back, the legend of Mama Lenshina grew. But the saddest part is the truth of what she stood for. A very evangelical Christian that preached salvation and the renouncing of traditional witchcraft and medicine. She was very strong on that. Very strong. Strongly preached against witchcraft and demonology. So unfortunately, because she didn't do that, 
inevitably, those who gathered around as her disciples and those who loved and followed her, wanted to pick up and continue where she left off, but there was no direct input. And so, without doubt, without doubt, the creeping in of African traditional religion and African traditional spirituality got into their beliefs. So what you start to see now is the Lumpa Church started to be mystical because you have this larger-than-life human being called Mama Alice Lenshin, a prophetess, woman of God. But she can't address her followers. So people start to claim they see her in their dreams. People start to claim she's appearing to them and giving them instructions. And they must do this and they must do that. I mean, that's the story behind building a shrine for her in Chinsali. So when you go to where the church was, because I believe it was destroyed as part of the whole idea of banning the Lumpa church. So they went and destroyed that massive structure. They had a massive structure that could sit over a thousand people in 1964. There is an aerial picture. There's a plane that flies over Chinsali and takes pictures of the church and films. Now, now I don't know who has the video footage of it, but you see how large that church was. By then, obviously, they had already begun to dismantle the Lumpa church. And that's why somebody went to film that church. There's an image of the church, massive church. And that was in 1964. So when she died in 70, whenever that was, uh, they couldn't do anything. They had to wait until 91, 92, 93. So it was during Chiluba's time when they were given amnesty that they went back to that place and they then built a shrine for her. So there is a shrine. There's all sorts of stories around the shrine. Some people claim that they've seen Mama Alice Lenshina appear there to them. There are others who claim that she's come to them in their dreams, given instruction. There are all manner of narrations around this uh, this woman in her church. But here's what I'm telling you. They embraced African traditional spirituality and religion. And it, it merged into the Lumpa Church, which now rebranded as the Jerusalem Church. And when you study some of the things they do, you realize that ATS is in there. And this, again, is the reason why a number of people have risen up to say, be cautious about Mama Lenshina, be cautious about the Lumpa Church because they have African traditional spiritism. And my answer to them is because Mama Lenshina never addressed that congregation since 1964. She died without ever speaking to those people. And so because she never spoke, there was no recordings, there was nothing, there was no writing. She never had the opportunity that many churches in Europe and you know, systemic churches even here in Africa do, which is where doctrine is put down. You have a, a book, you have rules, you have the, the order and standards of the church and all these doctrinal statements. Nothing like that could happen for Lumpa Church. Because remember, the founder wasn't herself educated in theology. And on top of that, the founder, the, the, the people, the, 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 the members of the church had to spend almost 27 years. In fact, yeah, 27 years. They had to spend 27 years in hiding as a band church. Does that make sense now? Ah, there you go. Thank you very much, Greg, for posting that. Some people, please watch that video that my brother, uh, classic Greg Gondwe, has just posted in the link. You will see it. Uh, it's all there. She, it shows you what the army were doing. Uh, this is the national, the Northern Rhodesia Police and the Northern Rhodesia Guard, who were the army, were doing to the followers of Valenshina. So, uh, saints and friends, that brings me to the end of the Lenshina story. And I hope many of you uh, will learn from that. In fact, I think I like what Chansa is saying here. Let me just see if I can read it. That piece of history is important. Lenshina was not a mystical. Her followers became in her absence. Thank you. That's right. Nailed it, Chansa. Yes. Her followers became that in her absence because she was no longer there to guide. Anybody who knows the Lenshina story knows that the Lumpa Church and Mama Lenshina herself was very evangelical and she preached against witchcraft and any form of traditional medicine. She was very strong against it and she brought a lot of deliverance and revival in Chinsali because of that. So a lot of people knew her as being the one who preaches Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus appeared to her. So she was a true convert. But circumstances, history, politics, 
regionalism and the dynamics that existed in her time put her and made her a victim of bad history. But I pray that people like myself and those who know the truth will be able to share the real story of this great woman of God. In fact, I encourage many of you to share this video because some will never, maybe I won't make the documentary. So let me be at least on record that I did share the truth about uh, Prophetess Len Shina. So what's my concluding remark? The words of Brian really nail it. She was a genuine servant of God, a genuine woman of God, converted by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. She left a legacy in her early life that proved her true state of conversion, that she really did become somebody that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just unfortunate that because of the politics of the time, she became locked up and never got to address her followers for the remainder of her life. And so the followers, like people without a shepherd, ended up getting into all manner of things. And because she never had a manual with any kind of writing concerning their doctrinal position, concerning their rules and rituals as a church, their membership, ethics, and all these things, though she didn't have that. And so unfortunately, that's what led to where they are today. And I know a number of them will probably shoot me for saying, hey, you're, you're, you're berating our church. But I think I have a bit of a reputation when it comes to doing that. <laughs> I'm not berating the church. I'm just saying that that's the reality, that they did drift off. And that's why a number of my colleagues say, be careful with Jerusalem church. They are mystic. They are into mysticism. They are into this. They are into that. Yes, because their founder never addressed them from 1964 to her death. Alrighty. So on that note, thank you so much. Have a great Sunday. And remember to share this video, tag people, and have the debates. I will come later on to pass my comments and feedback on a number of your comments. Thank you for joining me and being with me this afternoon. God bless.